I'm Craig Just. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Iowa. And um, it, what a great uh, uh, session so far. And uh, it's only going to get uh, uh, better here as we go forward. Um, I do want to say as well that um, you know, we've got Joyce here. Um, we're going to have Mark Edwards uh, in Iowa City. Um, Joyce's uh, colleague there who was mentioned in her talk. I hope you can come too, Joyce, by the way. Come on. Come with Mark to Iowa City. Uh, but on October 27th, uh, we'll have Mark Edwards uh, in town. And so if you want to hear uh, his story, which is pretty powerful um, in many ways, he'll uh, deliver it with a certain level of passion, and he'll have a lot more time than Joyce did uh, to tell the story. So if you're interested, please uh, uh, look that up uh, in uh, October. Uh, but now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our uh, keynote speaker for the lunch. And I'm going to reverse your, uh, your resume just a little bit because there's something really cool at the very end that I, that I liked. Um, so in 2015, Sally Gutierrez uh, was awarded the Federal Laboratory Consortium's Laboratory Director of the Year Award and the YWCA Career Woman of Achievement Award. So congratulations from Iowa on those, right? <laughs> Uh, so Sally is the director of the US EPA's Environmental Technology Innovation Cluster Development and Support Program. So I tried to make my own acronym for that, which is ETICDISP. Doesn't really roll off the tongue. Um, but anyway, that's with the uh, Office of Research uh, and Development. Uh, the Environmental Technology Innovation Cluster Development and Support Program is a new effort led by Sally to advance environmental protection in tandem with economic development through the formation of community-based public-private partnerships. Please help me welcome Sally. I'm really honored and so happy to be here in Iowa. This is the first time that I visit this great state, and I've heard a lot about it, obviously, through the election process and how important you are in that regard. But uh, it is just such uh, a great opportunity to learn more about your state and your water issues. I meet with stakeholders from really all over the world to understand kind of the problems that they're dealing with. And uh, there's so much more that we have in common as a global community than we do, uh, you know, we think about our issues being very local, but the problems we have here are certainly the same in many other parts of the world. So uh, I wanted to, to thank Dave and Leslie very much for their support and their, uh, you know, just willingness to host me and uh, to have me be a part of that. And to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing on water technology innovation. Uh, I greatly appreciated um, Peter's remarks this morning because everything here is about choices and there are new models emo emerging, there are things that are happening that could lead us down a very different path in a very positive way moving forward. So with that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where I'm from. I'm from EPA. I'm a part of EPA that is probably not all that well known, but we are part of the Office of Research and Development. Uh, myself, I uh, am from the laboratory in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Cincinnati has been a center for federally sponsored water research for over a century. So the first scientist that really had the opportunity to study water, how to assess, how to detect contaminants in water, were really very much focused on studies of the Ohio River. And it is a very large uh, research operation one of the largest in the world. Certainly, it's the largest federal water research laboratory in the country. So the investment from the federal side is pretty substantial. 
it's a place of new knowledge. It's a place where there's great uh, minds at work. And we continue to support the agencies, support our regions, support our states, and even individual utilities and industries as they try to grapple with some of these uh, very, very important and very challenging problems. Um, I wanted to just mention Flint kind of perhaps in a little bit different way than what has been explained up to this point because I think an underlying uh, issue here is that the city of Flint, not unlike many other cities that we have across the country, is basically broke. And so there is, I think, a higher risk, higher propensity to perhaps make decisions that would not otherwise take place because you have that construct, that context. And we have to find ways to really improve our cities and improve our regions to have this vibrancy. And I think that can also help us in this public health um, responsibility that we have to carry on to improve that and make sure people are safe. As was mentioned, Flint is just one of many recent uh, issues that we've had across the country. And these are just a sample of some of the ones that our researchers have certainly been part of and continue to respond to. But I can tell you that Toledo is still ongoing. It was quite a, uh, a catastrophic event. Uh, when I think about these issues where we basically took out the economy for this entire um, uh, part of the country, you know, it goes way beyond uh, some of the issues that are apparent in the, the safety and security of the residents. But it does have to do with our ability to have economies that work. And without that safe water construct, nothing can go on. Education of children, hospital uh, care, uh, and the like, nothing really can happen from an economic point of view during uh, these events. And there is a recovery that can be estimated in terms of the overall cost, and it is quite significant. Uh, importantly, for this example and the one to follow, it's uh, important that uh, we also recognize kind of the limitations of EPA and its authorities. So in this case, in the case of algal toxins in water, we do not have drinking water standards as a country for this set of contaminants. But as you can see from a, uh, um, an economic point of view, whether there is a regulation or not doesn't um, come into play at that point in time. But it is something to consider that the reach of EPA and the standards that we have are not universal, as some uh, would like to um, believe, I guess, as, as we, we know. Same thing, uh, Elk River uh, chemical spill in West Virginia, five plus uh, interruption, uh, shutdown of the economy, 300,000 residents affected. And again, it was one of those uh, contaminants that got into the water that was not under regulation, but it had such a low odor threshold that it was very apparent right away in the, um, in the workings of the water system. And it, it's a very fascinating case in response. 
Uh, you can imagine the uh, implications for refrigerators and other, uh, other devices that are in the system that are also then contaminated and all of that has to be managed as well. And the system brought back to recovery so that we can again have the continuation of the economic viability of these communities. Another uh, one, perhaps a little bit closer here, it was the Gold Key Mine spill. Again, the nation has a large number of uh, abandoned mines that are, some would say, ticking time bombs. Some of them are under cleanup uh, scenarios, some are not. Uh, in this case, as I understand it, the residents in this area were very concerned about putting the mine on a cleanup list, worrying about their property values, and that of course, is quite um, important, but it kind of complicates things as we're trying to do cleanup as well. So as we're moving forward again, these challenges are some that are recent in this country. When you look at these kinds of events, they're happening all over the world, different, each one unique, but still pointing to how can we as citizens, as communities, really, really make progress so that we don't find ourselves in this situation. Uh, I wanted to just mention that for business, and especially large global uh, uh, 500 uh, companies, water is very much at the top of the list. In whatever, when you look at all the sectors, uh, and this is a report that is put together by a group in the UK, in the UK called the Carbon Disclosure project. It's a survey of global 500 companies. And they get, these companies get this issue of threats to business, threats to their long-term sustainability and viability in bringing and creating wealth. So these issues around water risk, uh, there is uh, a lot of movement in many, many companies to really reduce that risk going forward. And of course, my, my message, my area is that new innovative technology can help us along the way. And it is um, something that I believe very much can help us to be more sustainable, offer better public health it going forward. I wanted to show you just a few examples of technologies, next generation technologies that are here. These are not in development. These are already in the marketplace and ready to be absorbed by the markets. So um, companies like Fathom, Fathom is creating an internet of water meters so that we can better conduct analytics around, um, around the delivery of water, better manage uh, billing and water consumption and the like. Valor Water Analytics from San Francisco. They are offering a platform to better um, assist utilities in, um, um, uh, in their billing processes. So money gets lost when the meters aren't working or the bills aren't quite right. And that platform helps to, in a very IT way, trying to create more uh, revenue for utilities just by looking at their billing systems. City Logics, I'll talk a little bit more about City Logics. They're based out of northern Kentucky, and they are offering a next generation water distribution system software. 
Aquisense, also from northern Kentucky, is uh, developed and marketed a UV uh, LED technology, first of its kind, and that is all based around how can we disinfect water with the lowest energy footprint possible. And again, these are technologies that are in the marketplace today. Cambrian Innovation is targeting the water, uh, the beverage, and the food industry by bringing better um, technology to extract energy from wastewater uh, processes. So the future is here, and we need to line up things to allow the uptake of these technologies going forward. I also wanted to mention that the federal government is very much an investor in early stage water technology companies through a program we call the Small Business Innovation Research. So through a competitive process, multiple agencies with uh, R&D budgets set aside a certain amount of money. And through this competitive process, we actually see the development of more innovative technologies. But at the end of the day, for all of the R&D and all the development, all of the investment that will follow, the markets really need to help us in delivering these new next generation technologies to solve and to address our water problems. So as you can see, there are a number of agencies that are involved in this process, an investment just over the last few years of over $90 million. These are the kind of technologies that we see. So everything from water monitors to, you know, wastewater treatment and the like. So we are making these investments and we are doing this because we feel so strongly that we need to continue to have new and better ways to manage and monitor and treat our water as it goes forward. These companies are represented by these dots on the map. So these, this is where these actual companies are located. I looked at the inventory, and Iowa only has one at this point. So I think from a state perspective, there's a great opportunity to get a larger share going forward to help address some of these issues that we have here. But the technologies are not enough, uh, even though, you know, we're making progress. But the business community is quite uh, amazing, and I, I uh, deal with so many companies on any given uh, year. And these are examples of companies that are trying to find new ways to actually uh, finance the, the installations of these new technologies. Core Infrastructure out of California, they are providing their own capital, so the utilities don't have to provide that upfront. It's more of a revenue sharing type of model, as is Arbok. And then a new player here over the last 12 months has been Generate Capital, who is working now with water utilities to identify projects where there could be a revenue sharing uh, type of model. I know one of the comments that Peter made had to do with there's no lack of money. And these are examples where you can say the money's there. They're just trying to identify projects. I know that, that, that there are other dimensions, I think, that uh, deserve attention, including procurement innovation. So we have now a couple of startups in this space, one called Splashlink and one called H2Bid. 
And what they're trying to do is create platforms to match these procurement actions or these opportunities, these problems with innovative technology providers. So these are exciting platforms that did not exist even three years ago. So they're very much in motion. And then one thing that's happening in the industry in the water and wastewater utility world is you're seeing water utilities that are establishing innovation programs within their operations. So, for example, DC Water has an entire department now that is their R&D arm. They're establishing their own technologies and patenting. They are... Uh, actively sourcing innovative technologies into that, um, into that utility, and it's amazing to see it uh, in motion. The Reclamation District in Chicago also recently got into this game, and they have adopted now the Ostera process, which is a struvite-type extraction technology that will create a fertilizer. And I wanted to mention them in particular because when they were set up as a utility, no one ever envisioned that they would ever get to the point where there needed to be kind of a part of it that would sell something. So they actually had to go to their state uh, legislature to allow them to make changes to their governing statute to allow them now to be able to offload the struvite um, uh, fertilizer that's going to be coming out from their uh, biosolids. So it's really interesting to see all of this in motion and to see the leadership that's being taken by the water utilities themselves. And again, you know, as someone who's been in this business for a very long time, these are game-changing behaviors that give us promise of what's to come and that there are alternatives that will be brought to bear going forward to solve these water problems. A lot of interest in this area on utility-based innovation. Um, but it's not enough, right? So we also need uh, policy innovation. And we have seen now examples where uh, there are challenges. Imagine H2O uh, did a challenge on uh, in California, water policy challenge, because we realize that we can do better in the constructs around innovative technology development and, and adoption, and that the policy environment has to be very friendly to that. Uh, Confluence, which is the water cluster in the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana region, they actually are working on cooperation of the uh, of the uh, EPAs there on adoption of innovative UV disinfection technologies. So we need policy innovation as well. And I mentioned finance innovation. The agency last year established a new center for water infrastructure uh, resiliency finance center to look to see what more we could do to better enhance the utilization of the state revolving funds for drinking water and water quality, and to really work more cooperatively with a broader set of players to help us to be innovative in the way that we help to finance water, drinking water and wastewater um, infrastructure. And then finally, um, our D and D innovation. So you're starting to see now new ways of even doing uh, research. Uh, Liquid is a startup 
that is focused on developing a platform for researchers to share data and information in a very much uh, citizen science type of construct. The Leaders in Innovative Forum for Technology is a utility-led uh, group out of the Water Environment Research Foundation, and they are gathering groups of utilities and bringing and vetting new technologies, testing new technologies. It's a very exciting program about 250 utilities Primarily wastewater utilities are participating as part of LIFT at this point. Uh, Challenge.gov, we've been doing a lot more with regard to how we source innovation through platforms like Challenge.gov, where we put uh, challenges out there and invite the world to bring us ideas or technologies we're starting to do something that I think is pretty exciting, and that is hackathons. So we're, we're really trying to uh, exploit IT expertise and bring the next generation uh, in line with these water problems to help us build solutions. So we're starting to see water hackathons. And then groups like Accelerate H2O, which is the water cluster, in the state of Texas, they are developing a testbed network for the state and making significant investments in that infrastructure going forward. So I've mentioned this concept of clusters, and I wanted to explain more what these are. And these are dense regional networks of players in the same industry that are dedicated to expanding that industry. And it's a, it's a model, it's interesting because it's a model of high-tech economic development. It's used extensively in many other uh, technology areas, but up until about the last 10 years, it was really not uh, embraced in the water technology um, arena. But the idea here for water is how can we more closely align all of these different players, universities, startups, local, state, federal government programs, support programs, large businesses, how can we better knit a uh, a social type of network around them to help them to know each other better, to really work toward this common end of bringing these solutions. And these groups in water are emerging, and this is, the, uh, this is kind of the thesis. Can we solve water problems and create economic opportunity at the same time? So in a collaborative way, and it is spooky at the beginning, believe me, we, uh, it's not uh, something that, in my view, uh, is easy to do, but when you can do it, and if there is drive to do it, then it can be a very, very powerful, powerful driver. And I'll talk a little bit about the one in Cincinnati, which EPA was very involved in the launch of that one and some of the uh, differences that I see in the way we operate now uh, where, uh, when we compare it to how we were operating prior to the launch of the cluster. But the model has been shown to be very successful. It, uh, it, there are surveys that are done of clusters throughout the world. The EU has a very strong uh, program in this. And the federal government in this administration has been providing a lot of support to build these networks. As a matter of fact, there's a solicitation out right now from the Economic Development Administration, and those proposals are due next week, actually, but there will be others to follow. But the, uh, the outcomes is to uh, see and promote the growth of existing industries, um, new industries emerge, and overall growth and development 
comes from these kinds of endeavors. So I started the program some five years ago, and at the time there were only two existing clusters that were in place uh, across the country. The first one and the longest standing one is in Fresno, California, and the second one was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But now we have 18 communities that are chasing this dream and organizing to solve water problems and create economic opportunity. EPA serves as a technical resource to these groups. They're all very community-led groups. We support them, but we do not tell them how to organize, who to organize, but we can inform on the model and we can share best practices from those others that are existing around the country and the world. I wanted to mention in particular um, the formation of Confluence because Confluence was very much underpinned through efforts by EPA. So we received a directive by then uh, EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson, and she asked us to go out to our community and to see if there was any interest in forming one of these collaboratives there. And luckily, we worked very hard with the, uh, with the community leaders. And in 2011, the community leaders agreed that they would form this kind of initiative. And we provided money not to the cluster itself, but rather to our researchers to better work with the business community and others there in the region. And I can tell you, we operated much differently back in 2010 than the way we are operating now. Um, I wanted to mention that even though you know EPA's regulatory and our enforcement arm is alive and well in Cincinnati, that despite all this enforcement stuff that overlays it, we are able to cooperate and support our water utilities in ways that you know are extraordinary. We know their research needs. We know. Um, what they are doing in, in terms of trying to source innovation. We even have a member of our research staff that is deployed to the utility at this point. And it is just a very, very different operating environment. We cooperate very closely with our U.S. Department of Commerce, with our U.S. Small Business Administration representatives on the ground. And it is truly a cooperative endeavor of all of the players, and it's just extraordinary to see what happens. And what does happen is the, um, the startups, for example, have a much easier time of it because of the organization of the players. I mentioned City Logics as uh, this next generation water distribution system software uh, company. That um, R&D was actually done in a cooperation between EPA and the University of Cincinnati. It formed into a business. The business incubators are very much a part of the ecosystem, and they were stood at the ready to help them. Our water utilities are very involved with the effort, and they immediately began to test and demonstrate the technology. It's being deployed not only there locally, but in places like Denver Water. They receive federal funding, I mentioned through the SBIR program, and we are working with them through our partners in the Department of Commerce to export the technology even at this point. But it's this alignment and cooperation that comes from these um, ecosystems that are forming. And it's um, an amazing thing to see in progress. And then to see the ecosystems themselves around the country support one another and work together. 
In the U.S., we are also watching uh, water clusters from many other parts of the world. And in particular, if I had more time, I'd tell you the Singapore story, because they're an exemplary um, example of, uh, of a water cluster and how they took their very, very challenging water problems and have created an economic development a, a, um, framework that is unparalleled. And in a couple of weeks, uh, Singapore, a little tiny uh, country, island country of 5 million people, will draw more than 20,000 water professionals to their country because of their leadership and their organization in this, uh, in this regard. So although we have very, very challenging water problems, we can look and cooperate with one another and really take it from saying, how can we, you know, not just think about these as water problems, but also to parlay that into an economic development opportunity. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank you very much for your attention. Check, check. There we go. So as has been the uh, custom, uh, we'll take some cards. There'll be some folks uh, that can come around um, and get them. I see we've got a few going. Um, as those get collected, I can uh, prime the pump a little bit. Uh, here in Iowa, uh, in particular, and I'm sure elsewhere, I'm interested in finance. Yes. And the financing, particularly for some very small systems, both on drinking water yes. and wastewater sides, the lack of flexibility is an inhibitor to innovation many times. Yeah. And so communities many times are forced to kind of overbuild mm -hmm. um, because they don't know if they can get money two years later to maybe add an extra polishing step or something yeah. like that. Any success stories in finance that you've seen where there's a little bit more flexibility and how do we do it here too? I think that opportunity is wide open at the moment. You know, one of the things that I really, I see the frustration of the innovators in trying to access and serve that market, for example. It kills them to go system by system, system by system, system by system. <laughs> you know, it's a very hard track for these innovators. They're doing it, but boy, they, uh, their investors are extraordinary in staying with them. I've always thought about opportunities, for example, to do uh, group buying around certain technology platforms, for example. We know that the cost is probably going to be less, that the, um, that the technology, um, you might have economies of scale. There, there are all sorts of things. And so, you know, that's a place perhaps that this group could think about. How do you use finance and cr think creatively about the different ways that we could do financing of these technologies differently. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still amazed that we have monitoring and reporting violations in small systems. That's a personal thing on, on me, having inspected many through my career. But uh, we have, I believe, the technological oomph to be able to solve that and make all of that go away. But we have to have resolve and leadership to get there. Yeah. Good. Um, this one here, um, I'll paraphrase a little bit, but essentially, can you discuss the challenges of uh, EPA, you know, being a federal oversight agency mm -hmm. uh, with enforcement activities, but then at the same time trying to be a uh, promoter of innovation, maybe mm -hmm. kind of two different sides of the coin? How does that work out? Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting because a lot of what we do in our regulatory schemes is to call out specific technologies. And we, um, you know, this is just me, not EPA, but I think that there are still opportunities that we have as an agency to better align and promote our internal processes to better support uh, new technology coming in and being part of, for example, our best available technologies and things that are very important. But I think one thing that I want to make absolutely clear is that Congress has been very, very sure throughout the last 20 years that we are to move research into practice. So technology development and deployment is part of the agency's mission, too. 
And we're learning more, and there's more to come in that. Yeah. Um, so the last question here, it actually spans three cards. So let's see if I can. Uh, <laughs> wow, okay. Let's see if I can, okay. can kind of put it together. Um, I think the gist of it is, is that uh, on the maps that you showed, with the yes. exception of at least one project that EPA is uh, part of here, but certainly on the company's map and the cluster's map, yeah. Iowa is kind of missing in a way. And so maybe it speaks to uh, what should the Iowas that are maybe missing in there. Uh, well, it might be two questions. You know, how did the other clusters form and what were the att mm -hmm. attributes that made that successful? And then perhaps, you know, are we just not applying or are we somehow not fitting into that cluster framework? Yeah. So we don't dictate to any community whether to pursue this or not. Clearly, we can... Um, uh, give examples and to point to places that have been enormously uh, successful in this regard. We, and, and for me, because these enterprises, these clusters are about the people and they're about communities, the community has to decide whether this is the right thing to do, first and foremost. I would say that in my experience working with the clusters, there's always one to two very key individuals who kind of lead the rest down that path and are the ones that are relentless in moving it and moving it and moving it and organizing and get everybody to uh, agree to a strategy and to actually buy into the concept and it's important to know that in what we know about clusters, these are not things that are just one to two years. They're long-term ways of operating, right? So if you're going to do it, you've got to be bought in, and you've got to stick with it through the ups and downs and, you know, be relentless. I mean, the story in Singapore is amazing, but one of the main things about there is that they've never lost focus. They want to dominate. They want to solve these problems. They're national security issues. Not unlike the issues that you have here in Iowa. These are your security issues. You need to call those out, and you can pursue this in a very strong way. But it takes leadership and resolve uh, and really long-term thinking about the value this kind of cooperation could mean for the state. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we should move on, but let's thank Sally uh, once again. Thank you. All right.